I'm going to call the meeting to order since we have a quorum now. Um, I'm Lori Willis. I'm the vice chair. Uh, Doris Cruz is not here this evening, so I will be running the meeting in her place. Uh, we start the meeting with the honor of the pledge. This evening we have Josephine Pitari, uh, the park manager at Brooklyn Districts 10 and 12 to help us with that. So would you like to come up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Um, all right, since you're all standing, we'll just, we'll go and. <laughs> Good evening. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. So <clears throat> I want to tell you a little bit about Josephine. Uh, she is the park manager of Brooklyn Districts 10 and 12. She's a lifelong Brooklyn resident. Josephine has always appreciated a love of nature and animals. Following these pursuits, she began her career at New York City Parks in 1986 as a park enforcement officer with the Mounted Unit in Brooklyn. She quickly advanced in the unit to supervisor in 1989 and to citywide captain by 1990. In 1994, Josephine joined the Prospect Parks team as director of special events, overseeing all outdoor permit activities and events large and small at Brooklyn's, Brooklyn's flagship park. In June 2002, she was promoted to civil service APRM and in December 2003 to chief of operations for Prospect Park. Josephine also assumed additional duties when PPA designated her senior VP of operations in August 2006. During her tenure at Prospect Park, Josephine oversaw 150 employees in maintenance, landscape, and special events. She also coordinated police park enforcement collaboration with park maintenance operations and the Prospect Park Alliance. Josephine began her current assignment as park manager for districts 10 and 12 in January of this year. Josephine has a BA in social sciences from the College of New Rochelle and an MPA from Baruch School of Public Affairs. She lives in Windsor Terrace with her happy-go-lucky Cocker Spaniel and her adult son, daughter-in-law, and two granddaughters also reside in Brooklyn and, she recent, and recently moved to a new home in the Gravesend community. So we want to thank you for leading us thank in the you. pledge and for all your thank service. You. Thank you. Um, from one animal lover to another, I want to give you a little thank you um, for doing the honor of the pledge. Thank you so much. Look at the picture. Okay. Surely. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very thank much. You. Okay, so now we would like the, uh, to adopt the agenda from the February 26, 2018 board meeting. Yeah, we have, <laughs> we have an overwhelming Joe Sokolowski, I'm sorry, Michael Festa, okay, um, seconds, and an adoption of the minutes. Who should I pick? <laughs> I'm going to do Joe again. <laughs> and Michael, I did Joe and Michael both times, okay. <laughs> Okay, um, and now we're going to move to the public session. Um, do we have this? Wait a minute, I have a number one already. No? Well, it's number seven. Oh, okay. Okay, um, first I would like to acknowledge um, our visiting dignitaries and elected officials <laughs> in the room. Um, I would like to uh, acknowledge Councilman Justin Brannan. Some of you may know, not sure. Um, Patrick Lewis of the Public Advocate, um, Police Officer Takas, the New York PD Community Affairs. Where are you? Uh, oh, there you are. I didn't see you back there. <laughs> Robert Burkhead of Congressman Donovan's office. <laughs> Amanda Zantano of the Fifth Avenue Bid. Jessica Callow from Burr President Eric Adams' office. Tori Kelly from um, Peter Abadi's office. Are we? Hi. <laughs> I'm having a hard time finding all of you. Um, James McLennan, State Senator Golden. Hi. How are you doing? Um, and Chris McCrate. 
also from Councilman Justin Brannon's office. Okay. Um, we have a number of people who would like to speak at the public session this evening. So I have been told we are on strict orders that you have to speak for a minute. You have a minute and a half to speak, and then we start ringing the bell. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. What's that? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Well, first we're going to call up Justin Brannon because I heard that there's some things um, that he would like to say. Is that true, Councilman? <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, I don't really have much to say. I have I just wanted to announce we have new office hours. Um, one of the things I promised on the campaign was we were going to stay open later so people could actually come visit us that that can't get to us between nine to five. so, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we're going to stay open until 8 o'clock. Um, and I think we're going to start doing weekend hours eventually, too, depending on how many people come visit us. So if it gets lonely, we're going to go home early. But uh, hopefully Tuesdays and Thursdays, we're there until 8 o'clock. Um, I had a great briefing with the Parks Department the other day, talking about a bunch of different projects that are cooking around here, from the ramp on 97th Street to the tennis courts here. Um, so I'll put out an update soon on all of that to, to let you know where we are with, with different uh, due dates and whatnot. And um, I guess that's it for now. Obviously, we're talking about what's going on with this development across from PS 104, um, and that's going to you know play out over the next weeks and months. And hopefully, we'll get as much community input into that as possible, um, and make sure that whatever becomes of that site is not decided you know, in a, in a room with, uh, with three men. I want the community to really get involved and, and uh, maybe possibly get the, the pr pr um, prospective buyer to come and address the community board to talk about what he wants to build there. Um, he can build as of right, right now. Um, he wants to build a hotel. Um, and you know, there, there's a whole bunch of different opinions on, on which they, that, that should go. So, but definitely want to you know really expand the conversation there and make sure that people in this room and people outside this room will be involved in deciding what's best for that site. So, um, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay, um, Patrick Lewis, public advocate. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to see everyone. Um, I'm Patrick Lewis from Public Advocate Letitia James's office. Just a quick update from um, our office, which is relating to Community Board 10, and that's that um, Public Advocate James recently signed on to a letter with uh, the council member, Council Member Menchaca, Senator um, Golden, Senator Felder, and Assembly Member Abate supporting um, the landmarking of the Angel Guardian Home. Um, you know, we are, you know, we are proud to stand up and say that we need to uh, keep community treasures, um, you know, around and not to, you know, demolish them and turn them into something that the community here doesn't want. And when Public Advocate James was in the City Council, she stood up against developers to construct the, who were planning to construct the Barclay Center. Unfortunately, she lost in that battle. But um, she stands firmly to believe that the community needs to be involved in the process when it comes to um, our, our communities. So, um, you know, we're here and we're working for you. And um, Josephine has my number. So if anyone here thinks that the public advocate could get involved and you're not sure, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me because we really are working for you. Thank you. Uh, police Officer Takas of the New York Police Department Community Affairs. You want it? No? You're going to pass this evening? All right. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs> Just the green sheets? All right. Okay. We are going to move on um, to, to the uh, speakers who signed up. So first we have Board Member June Johnson. Good evening, everyone. 
This is the fifth time I'm coming before you to ask you to join us at our blood drive this week. People don't realize how important it is to give blood. One pint of blood can help up to or save up to three people. For the last four drives that we've had, we've collected over 300 pints of blood. So my family is like so thrilled that we've helped almost 900 people. And so our blood, our blood drive is a celebration of life. We get together as a group. It's in the school where my son worked. And we serve food. Everything is free. We serve food. We have hero sandwiches. We have cookies and cake. We have over 20 prizes, raffle prizes, that you just put your name into a, you know, a, a little shopping bag while you're there. We really have a great time. For the teachers who come down after three, we have my grandchildren help at an arts and crafts table. We have Play-Doh, crayons, coloring books, and the kids you know, suck on lollipops and play with Play-Doh while their parents are giving blood. So it's really a wonderful day. I invite you to join us and help your fellow man. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Lisa Ferrara uh, about library events. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Ferrara, and I represent the Fort Hamilton Library at 9424 4th Avenue and 95th Street. We have many interesting mm -hmm. events and programs happening at our location. We have an after-school homework helper on Wednesdays from 3 to 6 p.m. We will be holding an email and internet basics class for older adults or anyone wishing to learn on Monday, March 26th at 10.30. We are now holding the Career Club, first Monday of every month at 3 p.m. So anyone who is looking for work, maybe you want to rewrite your resume, please stop by and someone can assist you. This person is specifically trained to deal with resume and job search questions. Our branch is also having Mandarin story time every Saturday now through June 9th at 3 p.m. And last but not least, we have Ready Set Kindergarten Fridays at 2 p.m. for ages three to five. For more information, please visit www.bklynlibrary.org. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And the next speaker is Sarah Gronin. Uh, with regard to the community forum on the proposed Williams Pipeline. And I think we, we all got her flyer out in the front on the way in. That's right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sarah Gronin. Um, I come to you tonight because of concern that uh, an Oklahoma company wants to build a fracked gas pipeline under New York Harbor, digging a trench 23 miles past Staten Island, Brooklyn, and the Rockaways. Um, this uh, has a lot of problems associated with it. We've got a flyer over there and a, a petition to the governor who could stop it. And in addition, you saw right, that I had this flyer. We're having a community forum next Monday night uh, at the aquarium on this issue where people can learn much more about it. I urge you to take more flyers and have your neighbors come. That would be really appreciated. Thank you. Under a minute and a half, right? <laughs> you, you were great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Patrick Lewis. Oh, Pat, I'm sorry. Sorry. You guys are really looking at me. Okay, Jessica Callow, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Borough Hall. Sorry, Jessica. Hello everyone. Um, I haven't been here for the last two months. I've uh, unfortunately been away. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jessica Callow. I work for the Borough President's Office. Um, I have a few messages with me. I don't normally say so much, but uh, first and foremost, community board applications. Um, they're on my desk. I've received them. We're in the process of 
of re reappointing and appointing new members. Soon we'll be meeting with elected officials. If anyone has any concerns about their application, please let me know tonight or sometime this week. I have uh, business cards with me if you don't have my phone number or my email, so reach out to me, please. Um, secondly, I wanna let everyone know that, remind everyone that attendance is really important. Um, just because you've been on the board for X amount of years doesn't mean you shouldn't be showing up. So if you were appointed last year and you don't think that attendance is important, you should be coming to these meetings. Uh, third, we have a lot of free things going on uh, the over the next couple of months. We have free legal services, we have free tax prep, um, a lot of cool stuff, so I invite everyone to take a monthly message in the side of the room over there and check it out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, and our next speaker is Robert Burkhead of Congressman Donovan's office. Good evening, everybody. All right, so I also don't normally say so much unless there's a lot of legislative updates going on in DC, um, which I'm sure you're also interested in hearing about. Uh, so I just wanna give you a rundown on what the Congressman's been up to. Uh, on March 14th, uh, US House Representatives had voted to pass a school safety measure co-sponsored by uh, the Congressman. It's called the Stop the Violence Act. It reauthorizes, modifies, and expands a Department of Justice program that awards grants to state and local governments to improve school security. The congressman said this is the first step in national effort to secure our schools. We're the most technologically advanced and innovative country in the history of the world with focus on resources. We can improve our school security affordably and effectively. Nobody should drop their kids off at school in fear for their safety. What this does is local and state governments have jurisdiction over nearly all education policies, including the school safety. So it's, uh, it encourages cities and states to implement more ro robust school security measures. The Stop School Violence Act authorizes $750 million in grant funding. Uh, what it does is it pro uh, provides services, uh, the development and operation of anonymous reporting systems, development of school threat assessment and crisis intervention teams, and continued coordination with local law enforcement. Congressman also co-sponsored a bill, which I'm sure you're all aware of uh, the incident that happened on TV um, in response to the, oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, he's, he's co-sponsoring a bill for Coquito the dog, uh, so nobody could store their um, pets overhead anymore. So I just wanna give you that. And also real quick, we're gonna be sponsoring a rain barrel event uh, with New York City Department of uh, DEP will distribute rain barrels on Saturday, April 14th from 10, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, at the Knights of Columbus on 1305 86th Street. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. No, you did a great job. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Emma Rooney of the Office of Assistant Speaker Felix Ortiz. Hi. Okay, a couple of things. Um, so last week the Assembly announced that the budget will include critical criminal justice reform funding, spending to confront sexual harassment in the workplace and over $36 billion in school aid. Um, uh, Assemblyman Ortiz at the beginning of the month also introduced legislation to place a one-year moratorium on fracked gas infrastructure development in New York and is calling for the formation of a committee to study and quantify the impacts of transporting and burned, burning fracked gas. Um, New York already banned fracking in uh, 2014, but there are still negative effects of transport transporting gas e across state lines and through state lines. Uh, the school uh, walkout was last week and we have the March for Our Lives coming up this week weekend. Uh, the Assemblyman has been meeting with school safety advocates as well as uh, working on in a legislation that would uh, strengthen school-based mental health systems including uh, requiring social workers in schools and introducing a statewide bullying hotline that would be available for students and families, not only for those who are victims of bullying, but for bullying, a bully, students who bully as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, that finishes the public session and we're on to the chair's report. Since Doris is not here, I will read the chair's report. Uh, Community Board 10, Chair's report, March 19, 2018. <laughs> I'm just reading this. Good evening, welcome to the third live broadcast of CB10. <laughs> 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 
I would like to thank the Academy. <laughs> Just kidding. I had to say it. I'm up here. Okay. Um, Doris did not write that in her report. Just want to let you know. Okay. Um, we don't have a Northeaster tonight, but don't let your guard down. I re Doris remembers a blizzard on Yankee opening day in the mid-80s. It was an unusual month. She did not attend committee meetings, and she missed it. We have, we have great chairs that run great meetings, but she misses the discussion and resulting collaboration of the committee members. I'm, I'm just gonna read this in the first person because this is weird. Um, I would like to start with a few acknowledgements. Thanks to Susan Pulaski uh, for attending the March Borough Board meeting. The main agenda item was the homeless problem in our city. Also, thanks to Judy Collins for attending the Borough President's Irish Heritage Breakfast and a special acknowledgement to board member Henry Stewart. He has the dubious distinction of winning the Riders Alliance Worst Commute of the Week. We do not congratulate you, but we offer our sympathy and support. Improved conditions in mass transit are essential to our community and to our city. We welcome our new precinct commander and look forward to working with him. While we are a low crime precinct, we do have drug problems, sex trafficking issues, and quality of life issues like noise and other problems from a few bars. Bayridge has many licensed establishments, but only a handful have recurring problems. In addition, offenses like speeding, running red lights, parking at hydrants, fire zones, and bus stops need to be reviewed. Illegal bus stop parking may seem minor, but not to a bus driver and to passengers. Drivers are supposed to only discharge passengers at the curb. If a bus cannot access the curb, they cannot discharge a wheelchair passenger, for example. This is unacceptable. Cars blocking fire hydrants are a public safety issue. If it takes firefighters an additional 10 seconds to reach that fire, that could cost a life. If a fire zone is blocked and fire trucks cannot turn onto a block and must carry their equipment to the fire, that might cost a life. We must remember why we have traffic safety laws. I would like to thank Council Member Brannon for his op-ed piece on tax equity. It is an important issue for our community. To use myself as an example, my 1,600 square foot house pays between two and three times in real estate taxes as a 3,000 square foot house in, Brownst in Brownstone, Brooklyn. We need tax e equity and fiscal prudence. We'd like to work with you on the excessive cost of many city projects. When it costs $3.75 million to renovate a 1,600 square foot park house, something is amiss. Are they using, are they using, the, Guggenheim are they using the Guggenheim solid gold toilet? In your position on the contracts committee, you can help review and resolve these issues. Recently, there was a horrific traffic accident in Park Slope. Two children were killed. It brought to light a deficiency in our traffic laws. There are drivers who repeatedly run red lights and who repeatedly exceed the speed limit in school zones and probably other areas. <clears throat> These are reckless drivers. The city found that red light violations decreased after cameras were installed. Yes, drivers learned where the cameras were located and their GPS told them where the cameras were located, but mostly they changed their driving habits. I know several people who have received speeding tickets in school zones, but they only received one ticket. They changed their driving habits. The school speed zone tickets are only issued when exceeding the 25 mile per hour speed limit by more than 10 miles per hour. That's 36 miles per hour and that is dangerously close to 40 miles per hour, which is usually the difference between serious injury and death. Members of the city council and the mayor are discussing changes to the law that goes beyond ticketing for repeated offenders. Please think of the safety of our children and all our residents and review these proposals. On a totally different matter, the New York State Senate included a provision in the state budget that would amend the multiple dwelling law in relation to the FAR in the city of New York. It, it is S6760. I do not think there is a community board in the city of New York that is more committed and knowledgeable on zoning and land use. Why is the state of New York including a provision to change local zoning law in the budget? I ask our state legislators to leave city zoning issues to the city. Thank you for your patience. Respectfully submitted, Doris Cruz, Chair CB10. And now for the district manager's report. Thank you, Lori. I'll do one at a time. <laughs> um, good evening, board members. 
Since we last met, um, the district office has been very busy working on preparing for summer street activity permit season. Speaking to the sponsors regarding the summer events and reaching out to all block party applicants regarding block parties. For our community board, we receive approximately 70 block parties per year and about 60% of those occur between August and September. All applications are now done uh, online and the community board receives an electronic notification. During the month of March, we reach out to all past applicants with a copy of Community Board 10's guidelines. It is a gentle reminder to make sure applications are made in a timely fashion in accordance with city regulations. Because if you don't meet the 60 days, you can no longer apply online and people come into us upset if they want to have a specific date. So we've adopted a policy of, of reaching out to all of our applicants proactively. I also attended the monthly borough service cabinet meeting this month. Dawn Tolson, who is the director of street activity permit office, reviewed changes to their website. They have some improvements and some updates that she shared with us. Block party applications, again, must be submitted 60 days prior to the event. They must be a member of a block association and given permission by their neighbors. CB10 does require a petition. Chair Bradley from the New York State Liquor Authority was also in attendance to meet with district managers and community board chairs and listened to our concerns and answered many questions and we appreciate his interest um, knowing that we have an important advisory role for new SLA and renewals of applications. The 86th Street overpass, if any of you have been by, um, staging work has begun. We received several concerns about pedestrians that were not heeding to the closed sidewalk and we requested additional signage and barriers be put into place for pedestrian safety. This is a New York State Department of Transportation project. The sidewalk is completely closed on the south side of 86th Street. Although the design build method employed on this project seeks to reduce the overall community impact as much as possible, we will certainly have impacts. The 86th Street Bridge has parking lanes and we will lose those parking spaces intermittently throughout the job, impacting the surrounding commercial spaces. And we've done a reach out to the 86th Street bid. The anticipated schedule is during the spring of 2018. The 86th Street exit and entrance ramps used to get on and off of the Gowanus Expressway will be shut down for nearly three weeks. The construction methods employed by the department should lead to a timely completion of this vitally important work, but during that time, we're gonna definitely see some impacts. And I will keep you posted. We also received word that the Ovington, a that Ovington Avenue between 3rd and 4th Avenue will be closed completely to vehicular traffic on two Saturdays in April, April 7th and 14th, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. for a crane operation. And that's related to the church construction, right? That's related to the church construction. Beginning on February 24, 2018, smoking or using electronic cigarettes, e-cigarettes, became prohibited in common areas of residential buildings with three or more dwelling units. Building owners must post updated signage and are being notified by the Department of Health. Also, the hookah legislation adopted by the City Council um, will be moving into effect. There was just a Department of Health um, rule change hearing. So we anticipate by April, the community board through its Senior Issues Housing, Health and Welfare Committee, I'm looking at the chair, Ida, we will be planning a meeting with all owners in the district of hookah lounges and restaurants who serve hookah with the Department of Health to give a briefing on the changes of law and, and what they should expect with that change for how they run their establishments and what licensing is required, et cetera. Um, just a few announcements. March 24th, the Bay Ridge Center will be having a March for Meals between 11 and 12. These will be posted on our website. The Brooklyn St. Patrick's Day Parade will be held this Sunday, March 25th. The parade will form on Marine Avenue, proceed to 3rd to 67th Street. Um, senior TAC event, that's also going to be sponsored by the Bay Ridge Center, um, will take place on May 2nd from 10 to 4. And I just wanted to take a brief second to just share with you that last year the community board partnered with the Bay Ridge Center on this initiative and it was about 300 seniors who participated at Our Lady of Angels. And I was there with some of the volunteers and it was truly 
um, an event that really assisted seniors in trying to um, break that digital divide, whether it was learning how to use a smartphone or learning about Netflix and different computer-based applications that they really eagerly wanted to learn about and some of which that I'm even intimidated by. Um, but this year, they're going to be hosting that event at Brooklyn Borough Hall. Um, the borough president's office is going to be um, the host. And it's a really good event, and I'm going to share that um, flyer with you and ask that if you know anyone who would be interested that you um, share that. I want to take a minute to congratulate board member Ria McCone for being honored um, with the Paul O'Dwyer Award at Borough President Eric Adams' Irish American Heritage Celebration Day. I saw Ria. Congratulations. I know board member Collins was there, and she shared that good news with us, so I wanted to take a minute and just offer our congratulations. Fort Hamilton High School is working with their seniors on a program called Fort Shadowing the Future. If you are interested in working with a senior in good standing to spend an afternoon or more in your place of business, to introduce him or her to the business world, you may contact Gregory Abood, the assistant principal. Um, we have his address, his email address, and we will share that with you. And there are some flyers that are on the side table. And the next general board meeting will take place on Monday, April 16th at 7 p.m., right here in this room to be broadcast. So on behalf of the district office staff and myself, I would like to wish all who observe a blessed Passover, happy Easter, and to all a very happy spring. Respectfully submitted. I have a question. It's a reconstruction. Well, it's a, it's a renovation, I should say. It's going to, but it's, it's not being completely demolished, but it's going to be re completely refurbished. I mean, so that. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. And the treasurer's report in the absence of, I'm sorry, Larry? Is that going to be any closure of the main roadway? There will be closures. Um, there will be intermittent lane closures. And there will also be closures to the entrance and exit ramps on the highway. But there's not going to be any shutdown. No. No. They're going to be doing it in segments and stages. We're going to learn more about it. We're going to have a presentation from the contractor um, in about, I think, the end of this week. So we'll, we'll know more to report. Carmen? Can we ask the politicians to make sure they put the new smoking laws in the newsletter? Because when the notice came to my building, it was just addressed. 54182nd Street, Brooklyn, New York. It wasn't addressed to the attention of the owner or there was nothing indicating who it should go to. And it sat on our radiator for two days and then I just said, I'm gonna open this up. Okay, and I think it should be posted too. I think if anyone has that building, maybe if you post it in your lobby so people are aware, especially if smoking is an yeah, issue. But, I don't know but certainly, absolutely, we could share that with the elected officials. Do we have them in the office? Yes, we do. Send them out. Okay. <coughs> All right, the treasurer's report. In our treasurer's absence, I will read it. The Community Board 10 treasurer, treasurer's report as of February 28, 2018. Total personal services, 127,629. Total other than personal services, 11,430.38, leaving an unencumbered budget balance of $94,850.77. Respectfully submitted. Thank you. Um, okay, I would like to, um, if I may, uh, make one quick change uh, to the agenda. Um, there was someone here who wanted to speak at the public session. Uh, Nick Chambaris of Nicole Maliotakis's office. Nick, you want to come up? You have a minute and a half. Give him up for 30 seconds and I'll make it noted. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, just want to mention that Nicole is in Albany during budget, ne budget negotiations. As always, she wants me to let you know that she has the interests of the taxpayers <laughs> as her first priority. Um, Nicole was also pleased to take part in the demonstration across PS 104. They'd like to see classrooms built across the street from there. They don't think it's the proper place for a homeless shelter. And uh, hotels really don't help the homeless. That's a conversation for another time. But we want permanent affordable housing for the homeless. Um, we're going to have a CPR seminar in June. More details will be forthcoming. Nicole would like to see you at next week's Bay Ridge St. Patrick's Day Parade. It's always a great event. And for all those who are celebrating, on behalf of myself and the Assemblywoman, have a happy Passover and a happy Easter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
that we will then move on to the committee reports. And yes, the next committee uh, report is police and public safety. So I'll be giving that report. <laughs> Have enough of me already tonight? Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, you're sweet. <laughs> the Police and Public Safety Committee met on March 5th, 2018. Uh, there were two items on the agenda. The first one was a new SLA on-premise liquor, wine, beer, cider license for Don Mario Rotisserie Chicken, Inc. The premises is 7302 Third Avenue. Uh, the applicant appeared by its owners, Rafael and Manuel Velasquez. Um, but in light of deficiencies uh, that came to light in their application, the applicant advised it would delay its application for one month and come and address us at um, our April meeting. And so we voted to adjourn that matter. Um, so that's just informational. We're not voting on that tonight. The next item on the agenda is an SLA alteration application for WM11 Inc. DBA The Wicked Monk. Uh, that is at 9508-9510 3rd Avenue. It's an alteration application uh, to alter the licensee's already existing full on-premise liquor license based upon the expansion of its existing premises. Uh, the applicant appeared by its owner, Mr. Michael Dorgan. The existing premises have been operated as a bar restaurant for quite some time without adverse history. Um, they recently acquired the adjoining storefront, which was a real estate office, and they've expanded into that space to use it as a party room. Um, in response to the community board's notice to residents um, of this alteration application, only one comment was received, and that was with regard to the complaints of cigarette butts on the sidewalk in the morning. Um, Mr. Dorgan advised he does clean the sidewalk, and he'll take efforts to address that. Um, other than that, there was no other comment from the public, and the committee voted unanimously to approve the licensee's alteration application. We did meet in quorum. So this motion is on the floor. So are there any questions or comments? You know, most of us are familiar with the Wicked Monk. Yes, Brian. Construction started already or not? It's actually complete. <laughs> they expanded. The storefront is finished. Um, and it's just, they just broke through the wall. It's just a room with, with additional seating and tables. Anyone else? So there is no other stipulations? No, there are no other stipulations. They have no adverse history. Um, and there was really, you know, other than the cigarette butt comment, nobody complained. <laughs> Um, anyone else? Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, is there, with respect to the party room, I know we had another party room re recently. Is there any kind of a, uh, an exception, or are they going to uh, follow the same rules with respect to closing and that kind of thing? Same rules. The same rules apply. So there, the alteration application is just to expand the premises, but everything else on the license remains the same. Okay. Any other questions? Any comments? Okay, so I'd like to move the question. Um, all in favor? Any <laughs> abstentions? Any recusals? Uh, any against? Okay, so the motion carries and um, we've approved the application. Thank you very much. And that's my report. Okay. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is Traffic and Transportation Committee. Okay, thank you so much. The membership of the Traffic and Transportation Committee met on Tuesday, March 13th, 2018 at 6.45 p.m. The first item on the agenda was the street naming application continued hearing for Justice Arthur M. Shack Way at 8901 Ridge Boulevard. This item is up for discussion and vote. Once again, to remind you, Community Board 10 street naming procedure is to invite the applicant to the Traffic and Transportation Committee meeting to present their application. The application is then shared as an information report at our general board meeting before going back to the committee for a vote and recommendation. Last month, Mrs. Delia Schack had brought a detailed application listing the many accomplishments of her late husband, who spent his lifetime committed to service to others. This application exceeded the guidelines for both Community Board 10 and the city application for street naming. The documents provided evidence of a lifetime of sustained community service. 
as a local high school teacher, as an attorney for the Major League Baseball Players Association, and ultimately a New York State Supreme Court Justice, Arthur Schatt continued to volunteer his time to many organizations, including the Boy Scouts of America, the Guild for Exceptional Children, Friends of New Utrecht, the Bay Ridge Historical Society, and our own Community Board 10. The members of the committee met in quorum and unanimously approved this application. This item is now up for board discussion and vote. Any discussion to be brought to? So then we are ready to vote. Delia is here. I'm sorry, I didn't see. Welcome. Okay, so no discussion? Um, okay, so um, did you meet in quorum? Yes. You did, okay. So all in favor? Any against? Any abstentions or recusals? Okay, so the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda was an application for the Third Avenue Festival, October 14, 2018, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Third Avenue between Bay Ridge Avenue and 94th Street, event ID 388096. To recap, in December of 2017, Community Board 10 held a joint committee meeting with Police and Public Safety Committee and the organizers of our local festivals to discuss issues and concerns from the 2017 festivals. The committee met in quorum and unanimously voted to approve the application with the following stipulations. One, NYPD amplified sound permit to end at 6 p.m. Amplified sound permits will be issued at the discretion of the Third Avenue merchants and all applicants must adhere to the New York City noise code regulations and NYPD rules relating to sound permits. A list of permits must be provided to Community Board 10. Our third point, DSNY must begin cleaning at 6 p.m. and cleaning must commence at Bay Ridge Avenue and alternate each year. Number four, all SLA licensed premises applying for one day outdoor use must submit a signed letter notifying Community Board 10 that their SLA licensed premises received the SAPO Festival rules as well as the stipulation agreement with Community Board 10 and will comply with all rules during the events. Number five, Violations of SAPO rules will be subject to enforcement by SAPO, NYPD, and SLA. In addition, the community board will submit complaints of rule violations with documentation to SAPO, NYPD, and SLA. Number six, establishments that do not obtain a one-day SLA permit will not be permitted to serve alcohol. Festival marshals must report any vendor or businesses selling alcohol to NYPD for enforcement. Number seven, distribution of festival regulations to all participating vendors and merchants. And number eight, the Third Avenue Merchants as sponsor will attend an interagency meeting organized by Community Board 10 with the leadership of the NYPD, DSNY, SLA, SAPO, and DOT. This item is now up for board discussion and vote. Any questions or comments? I yes, go ahead. I, I, <laughs> I do have a question. Um, the sound permits that are going to be issued by the Third Avenue merchants, is there any restrict, uh, restriction as to distance? So if you have amplified sound, can they be one on top of the other uh, within the discretion of the Third Avenue merchants? So historically, the, it's been at their discretion. The, they've really tried to keep it to one amplified sound you know, permit, but if there was two bands, they, they really try to work it out and alternate each so they're not competing with each other. So that's what we suggested that they do, that they 
really speak to their merchants, whoever wants to have it, and as long as they comply with those rules, we're okay with it, but they really have to, um, they're gonna be providing us with that list in advance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. I think the permits are issued by the police department. The police department. Right, but uh, how would the police department know this was approved by the committee or not? Yeah. Uh, so are they getting their approval first? That's a great question, Habib, and I have a great answer for you. So it's one sound permit that is issued to the event. And then the organizers, what they do is they plan where sound is gonna be from that, that permit, and they're gonna give us that list. So pretty much the police, the organizers, and the community board, we all, all work together on the, the Third Avenue Festival coordinators lead. Um, Chip does a great job, he plans out, you know, which locations will get, will get sound. But it's one permit with multiple locations. Um, and they have to organize the event so that they're not competing interests and, and and that it ends at six o'clock when the festival ends so we don't get the noise complaints afterward. Okay. Brian. If I missed it, uh, I'm sorry, but who's gonna enforce if the sound is over? Who's gonna Another have the equipment? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the marshals of the event will go over to the person, say if they exceed it and say, hey guys, you know, you have to lower it or time is up. If they do not comply, then the police department, and usually that, you know, the officers on scene will. Sound meter too? Um, well, we have a sound meter, so we'll have to bring ours. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Okay, so I think, I think we're ready to call the question. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions or recusals? One. Okay, one recusal, okay. Thank you, so the motion carries. Thank you very much. The next item is an application for the Third Avenue Weekend Walk Summer Stroll on July 13th, 2018 and August 3rd, 2018 on Third Avenue from 68th to 80th Street. Although the weekend walk summer strolls are presented as two votes based on the street locations, we discussed the issue as a whole. Our discussion once again benefited from the previous meeting in December, and the committee unanimously agreed in quorum to approve the applications with the following stipulations. Number one, DSNY vehicles must begin cleanup no later than 10.30 p.m. Number two, the location of commencement of cleanup will be decided in consultation with NYPD, DSNY, summer stroll organizers, and a representative from Community Board 10. Number three, all SLA licensed premises who plan to serve alcoholic beverages must submit a notice of alteration to Community Board 10. Number four, all SLA licensed premises filing for a one-day outdoor license must submit a signed letter notifying Community Board 10 that their SLA licensed premises received the rules of the DOT Weekend Walks Program, Third Avenue Summer Stroll event, as well as the stipulation agreement with Community Board 10 and will comply with all rules during both events violations of the DOT weekend walk rules Third Avenue Summer Stroll event will be subject to enforcement by SAPO, NYPD, and SLA. In addition, the community board will submit complaints of rule violations with documentation to SAPO, NYPD, and SLA. Number five, amplified sound locations will be issued at the discretion of the Third Avenue Summer Stroll organizers and all applicants must adhere to the New York City noise code regulations and NYPD rules relating to sound permits. A list of all locations must be provided to Community Board 10 in advance of the event. Number six, all amplified sound permits issued by NYPD must end at 10 p.m violations of the sound permit regulations will be referred 
by Community Board 10 for enforcement. Number seven, NYPD personnel or auxiliary personnel must be able to cover all intersections open to ve vehicular traffic for pedestrian safety. Number eight, all participants at the DOT Weekend Walk 3rd Avenue Summer Stroll must comply with the direction of Summer Stroll Marshals. Number nine, the 3rd Avenue Merchants as Sponsor will attend an interagency meeting organized by Community Board 10 with the leadership of the NYPD, DSNY, SLA, SAPO, and DOT no less than one month before the first summer stroll event. And number 10, distribution of DOT weekend walks regulations to all participating merchants. The committee unanimously voted to approve with these stipulations. This item is now up for board discussion and vote. Okay, so that was a lot <laughs> and a very good job. Are there any uh, questions or comments? Any discussion? No. Okay, so then uh, we are ready for a vote. All in favor? Any against? Abstentions or recusals? <laughs> we have one again. Rhea. Okay, thank you. And our last item is the application for the Third Avenue Weekend Walk Summer Stroll, July 20th, 2018, and August 10th, 2018, on Third Avenue from 80th to 90th Street. The committee unanimously voted to approve with the same stipulations that were just explained in the previous Weekend Walk Summer Stroll application. So this item is now up for board discussion and vote. Okay, so the first, uh, just to clarify, the first vote was for 68th to 80th Streets. Um, they broke it into two parts, and then this is for the um, second portion of the stroll, which will go from 80th to 90th Streets. So it's all the same stipulations, all the same rules. Uh, any questions or comments this time? No, okay. So all in favor? Any against? Abstentions or recusals? And we've got, again, one extension um, or recusal. Okay, and um, that concludes our report. Thank you. That was a great thank job. I just, I just want to note that we really owe our thanks to Josephine for helping to really set this up and get communication going between all these different parties. And that's really what made it work. Thank you. Thank you. And our next item on our agenda is our zoning and land use report. <laughs> Thank you, Acting Madam Chair. You're doing a great job tonight. <laughs> so the uh, Zoning and Land Use uh, Committee met on March 15th at the district office. Uh, um, and we had one topic, a rare night where we don't have anything to actually vote for, so you can just listen. Um, the Special Bay Ridge District's um, CA2 permitted uses is what we discussed. The committee discussed the pending sale of the property at 9114-9116 Fifth Avenue here in Bay Ridge, which uh, Council Member Brandon spoke about earlier, um, as well as a few other people. The property is mostly made up of a vacant lot across the street from PS 104. There has been a lot of reports, statements made by elected officials, and a rally concerning the future of this property. What we do know for a fact is that the property is under contract to be sold by April 1st, and that there is a pre-filing with the Department of Buildings for a six-story hotel. The property is, a, is in a CA2 zoning district, commercial district, uh, which allows for commercial uses, including a hotel with an overall height of 70 feet as a right. Since the development would be as a right, there's unfortunately not much that this board can do in terms of power to prevent the hotel from being built. However, the committee during, dis during our discussion does not believe that we need another hotel in our community. We need more classrooms, we need more affordable housing, we have other needs. We already have two hotels in our community and don't feel an additional hotel would thrive in this area. Now I have to set the record straight. This is not about a homeless shelter. 
We've heard people mention that. We've heard elected officials mention that. And that is not what is happening here. All we know right now is there is a sale and a pending application for a hotel to strike fear into people by saying that that's what's going to happen here. It's way too premature. Right now, the committee has discussed that we do not need a hotel. We are not talking about a homeless shelter. And anyone who's talking about that should quiet themselves. The committee believes that although we will not be able to prevent this hotel from being built with the, without the cooperation of the new owner, we want to explore ways that would allow us to have a say should future developers wish to do the same. To that end, the committee has begun to look into two potential options. The first would call for a citywide text amendment that would create a special permit any time a hotel is proposed in areas now deemed as of right. By linking creation of a hotel to a city planning special permit, it would give community boards, borough boards, and the city council some power to decide where and when these structures can be built. Recently, the city passed a change that ties the creation of storage units in manufacturing districts to the need for a special permit. The committee believes the same should now be done in the case of hotels. The committee understands that the creation of a citywide tax change could be a long process, and thus we will simultaneously explore a second, op second option, which would be to amend the Special Bay Ridge District. The Special D Bay Ridge District was originally created in 1978, and its purposes include encouraging design of residential, commercial, and community facility development, which is in character with the neighborhood and surrounding community and the preservation and maintenance of the existing scale and character of the residential and commercial community. The committee believes that through the special Bay Ridge District, we have an opportunity to create a special permit for the development of hotels in our community without needing a citywide change. The committee believes that un unlike other parts of the city with large commercial areas, Bay Ridge has a small pocket of commercial area that is surrounded by a large residential zoned area. The committee believes that hotels are not in character with our neighborhood and do not belong. Hotel development should be limited to large scale commercial areas. The committee, with the help of CB10 staff and interns, will work aggressively to accomplish these goals to prevent further developments like this from taking place. The committee adjourned at 8.30, respectfully submitted. Brian Kazuba. Any comments, questions? Yeah. Do you believe that we can write a letter to the building department trying to object on the project? Is there a way that we can come forward and say, you know what, this is what we think, that's what we say? Uh, un unfortunately, it, it is as a right. So they, they, they have, by statute, they are allowed to build a hotel. In the, in the, so, so as long as they're not exceeding anything, um, there's nothing that even the building department can do to, to say no to it. Barbara? Yeah, I think where the confusion or this word about homeless is coming up is that maybe about two years ago, Mayor de Blasio was on TV and he spoke about when hotels opened that a certain amount of units had to be set aside for homeless. And that was about two years ago. So I think people remember that. And when they hear about a hotel growing here, that's the first thing they think about. But I do remember that also. Yeah, and, and that might be the case, but that's not what's happening here. It's, it's not what's, what's being discussed. So it, it's purely speculative and hypothetical um, that that would potentially happen in the future at this location. Brian? How many units is the proposed uh, six 63. 63. Wow. That's six floors. Yeah. Ten floors and, per floor. Um, as of right, one could say, is always a gray area. We could request that the building department uh, explain and review the so-called as of right zoning calculations, question them, so to speak, and ask them to be defended. We, we could do that. Slow things down. You know, I mean, it is a lot of room for two yeah. stories. Yeah. yeah. So these rooms are going to be either really small, like closet size. I can't even imagine that amount of units. I mean, we've, we've done that in the past. We've asked the Department of Buildings yeah. to, s to review the submitted plans on the application mm -hmm. um, to make sure they're yeah. zoning compliant and they meet 
other building department specifications. So we'll be definitely watching. <coughs> Any other comments, questions? No. No, there there isn't, yeah. I mean with that many units, is there any limitation on the occupancy? Can each do what, each unit there have five or six guests or is there a guest limitation? There's gotta be a guest limitation a for safety, for fire safety, right? Sure, I'm, I'm sure there would have to be strict yeah, fire code and, and, and whatnot would have to be complied with which there definitely would be a, an yeah. occupancy you know it's gonna have standby yeah. uh, like sprinkler system? Right. They were, they're required, hotels are required to have all of that, you know, sprinkler systems, live load weights, I mean, all of that is, is part of it. It does, I agree, it does seem like a lot of room. <coughs> it fits on the 70 feet with the mechanicals on top? Right, there's no, right now it's a pre-file, there's no plans that were submitted, there's a pre-file, so. Uh, Michael, then Steve. Is the developer someone who has already built hotels somewhere else, or is this? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, that, Excellent question, and yes. <laughs> Yes, we, we're aware of the, um, the East, East New York Inn? No, he's not. He's saying he's not associated with the East okay. New York Inn, but there are many other hotels. Right now, he purchased land in Coney Island. The development of a hotel has, is, um, he's been in, in, in this type of hotel um, development for some time. He's a physician, uh, an op ophthalmologist, um, but his, has, his family has been developing hotels. Isn't he the Comfort Inn on Third Avenue? He doesn't work here. No, the, the, the hotel, the Comfort Inn on Third Avenue, is that, it's his. I, I have to go back to that. Oh, I didn't see that. I have to look at that. I don't know. Okay. Uh, Steve? I know in LaGuardia he has one. Of yeah, another one. I believe that there's, uh, if there's 63, and, and we didn't know that number when we spoke about it the other day, but if there's 63 rooms in there, I think it's important for everybody here to understand that I think that that, uh, only requires eight, uh, isn't that what we figured out the other day? Yeah, we figured out eight, eight parking, parking spaces, spaces yeah. in the entire hotel, right? So I think that there, if there was something that we could do here, the more spaces we can get, because that's going to be a real problem in that area if they're successful. <laughs> so, so. Does this include where the car lot is on 92nd Street, too? Yeah, it's it's a weird shaped lot, which we're I think we're still trying to exactly figure out the diameters too. But it's 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 start the main entrance is on for is on Fifth Avenue, but it it tees out to Ninety Second Street. And, and there is property for Fourth Avenue on the south, not directly behind, but close to it. Are, are you familiar with any of the uh, other hotels that have been built? What type of I mean, the quality, what, what type of, you know, hotel we, we can anticipate. We're putting that together. We're doing some research on There are a lot of hotels that bear his name or surname. Mm -hmm. So we just want to flush it out so we can see what some of his past jobs are and, and what the experiences are there. So there are many. Um, some that we're sort of supposed to say that were high end, some that were a varying size of the scope. So we just want to make sure that they are his hotels, if, if, right. you know, we want to just make sure. So we're going to be researching that this month. I have one more question. So considering the fact that this is as of right, um, let's assume, you know, his apartment building plans will go in and they'll be, you know, tweaked and amended. But let's, let us, you know, proceeding with the notion that what he's got filed now is probably pretty close to the, uh, the developer's plan. At this point, um, I mean, we're talking a lot about it, but, and, and maybe that, you know, to learn some lessons for, you know, other possible soft sites that are out there that we may run into this problem with. But with regard to this specific location, is there that much we can actually do? No, no, as, as, as I said earlier, if it's as a right and, and, and if they conform to the building code, the fire codes, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do except hope and, and suggest and work with our elected officials, you know. Yeah, ex ex exactly. You know, you know, Council Member Brown said he was continuing to talk to him. So hopefully, hopefully something else will work out. But there's nothing 
uh, legislatively power that we have to be able to affect it. Okay. Any other comments? Any questions? Well, clearly this isn't a Marriott or a Sheridan or a Hilton hotel. Is it going to become another Prince Hotel? <laughs> <laughs> it's not Marriott. We, we, we hope not. not. Yeah. We, we hope not. Concern. Can we forbid hourly rates in that hotel? Something like that. Part of it. Our hotel wants to know if we can, in some way, um, regulate the um, hotel usage to forbid the practice of things like hourly rates. You put that for example. Yes. Yeah. All right, well, thank you all. See you next month. Okay, um, and now we have a report from the Communications and Public Relations Continued Development of the CB10 Newsletter Informational Report by Michael Festa. On a lighter note, um, the Communication and Public Relations Committee met on Wednesday, March 14th at 7 p.m. to discuss the continuing development of the Community Board 10 Digital Newsletter. Um, the ETA is uh, from May 2018. Um, the district office reviewed several email blast sites, including Constant Contact and MailChimp. Also spoke with Borough Hall Billing and learned that Constant Contact is registered as a vendor for the City of New York. The Borough President's Office uses this service for their newsletter. CB10 formally signed a contract for the service at $46 a month. Um, the contract includes one email per month sent to no more than 2,000 email addresses and can be updated as needed for further cost. The service can sort through duplicate email addresses and includes hyperlink, photo, and calendar capabilities. Also, the service includes a dashboard for translations into multiple languages. So it's a, it's a living document. The district office had an initial face-to-face -face meeting with constant contact and a second meeting will be scheduled shortly. The district office has hired a new intern, Maria, to focus on this and other projects. Maria is a junior at Fordham University majoring in political science and will be with us till at least June and maybe through the summer. A contest. We are asking board members to name the newsletter. A board member can submit as many names as they wish by emailing the district office prior to April 9th. We already have received um, several names. Thanks, Steve Harrison. Um, the winner will be chosen by the committee and may be spotlighted in the first issue of the newsletter. The newsletter will be uh, limited to board business and will be a one-page screen with four or five segments as follows. Um, and and this, this could change. Um, Josephine's district manager report, community events, committee reports, city agency announcements, and historical facts relating to Bay Ridge, which ought to be fun. Um, each segment will contain additional hyperlinks to sites or files that relate to the subject, including the PBS broadcast site. Photos can also be added. Once the newsletter is published, a link will also be added to the Community Board 10 website with a sign-up page. Next steps, expand the email list. Uh, we have a goal of 2,500 emails on the distribution list by year-end 2018. Maria is going to continue to work on development um, with the committee and the district office. Um, a second meeting with representatives of Constant Contact will be happening soon, and committee members will be attending. The newsletter name contest, um, finalization of a working draft of the newsletter, and finally a presentation to the full board. And I'd, I, you know, I'd like to thank the district office team for the hard work that they've done on this, too. And it's, it's been a lot of fun so far. Um, any questions or comments? Steve. Can I hear that there was, uh, uh, if when the newsletter goes out, will there be room for comments or anything of that nature? I don't know. Are we going to do something like that at this point? Yeah, I think there'll be a, maybe a hyperlink to email us. Yeah, but not public. Just, uh, just no, not no, not public. No, no, not public. But, um, Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, does any, any anyone have any uh, any other questions for Michael? 
No? Okay. So that concludes our agenda for this evening. So any old business? Anyone want to bring up anything? Any new business? You have, um, I, we do have a, a comment from uh, someone from the public. Yes. Great job on <laughs> Thank you very much. That, see, that's such a nice comment. <laughs> we like that new business. Okay, uh, we have a motion to adjourn uh, by Pastor Elliot Team. <laughs> and Barbara is second, and we have a third. Um, all in favor? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks.